Hello, and welcome to this edition of StatsNax. My name is Tim Schofield, and I'll be presenting on the scientific method. Briefly, I've been in the industry for nearly 50 years, starting with the non-clinical statistics department at Merck Research Laboratories. I then moved on to GSK, where I was in regulatory affairs, and took on senior scientific leadership roles in MedImmune and in GSK again in their technical research and development departments. I'm currently owner and consultant of CMC Sciences, and you can be reached by uh, email at my email address, tim at cmcsciences.com or through LinkedIn. The objectives of this particular talk are to share with you the principles and steps of the scientific method. Uh, hoping that you become aware and avoid some of the pitfalls in its application and understand the value of collaboration between CMC statisticians and non-statisticians. So let's look at the scientific method. And I'll offer that we often carry out the steps of the scientific method without realizing it. We ask a question, which I'll call the study objective. So take as an example, should I take an umbrella to the game? We follow by designing a study uh, or determining how to address the question, uh, such as uh, sampling a few weather apps. We might be conscious of the rumors that some of the weather apps are owned by umbrella companies, and therefore we may want to randomize, which is part of study conduct. And then finally, once we acquire the data, we analyze the information and make a decision which is the last step or the study analysis stage. So for instance, more than 50% of the apps say there's greater than an 80% chance of rain. So we decide to take an umbrella to the game. Now putting this on more common footing for uh, pharmaceutical research and development, uh, let's look at those steps for some particular uh, examples. Consider two questions that are commonly confused in the pharmaceutical industry. One is uh, what I call a difference test. And the question we're trying to answer are, uh, is, are two means different? Now, this is usually formulated in statistics as a pair of hypotheses. The hypotheses read in this case what's called H naught. Uh, a, uh, mu A is equal to mu B versus uh, H alternative, H A, mu A is not equal to mu B. This is sometimes reformulated as a difference and uh, done so so that I can exhibit the second uh, form of this question. That is mu A minus mu B is equal to zero. That is, there is no difference versus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there uh, is no difference versus mu A minus mu B is not equal to zero. Now this can be contrasted with what's called an equivalence test. And that test is meant to answer the question, are two means equal? And using the same uh, parameters, that is the difference in means of A and B, we formulate it uh, a slightly differently. That is, we're not looking for a zero difference, but we're looking to see whether a difference is within some pre-specified equivalence margin, which I symbolize as the Greek letter delta in this case. Now note, the uh, alternative hypothesis is what's commonly called the research hypothesis. It's a question that we're trying to address. So in the first case, we're trying to address whether the means are different, and in the second case, whether the means are equal. I note further that the null hypothesis cannot be addressed in this fashion or in uh, a statistical manner here, uh, nor in some cases would we want to. And consider the case where we're looking to see whether mu A minus mu B is equal to zero. Well, we can never prove that it's exactly equal to zero. So in that case, at least it would be impossible to show that uh, the null hypothesis, hypothesis mu A minus mu B equal to zero is true or not. Now, this is usually analyzed uh, in the end, in the last stage of the uh, scientific method, using confidence intervals and uh, representing these confidence intervals as either being within the plus and minus uh, equivalence margin or delta in this case, 
or overlapping the uh, null of zero difference. Uh, scenario, scenario A shows a case where the confidence interval overlaps zero. So we can say there's uh, no evidence of a difference uh, if we're doing a difference test while it falls outside of the equivalence margin saying that there's no evidence that they're equivalent. So this is a lose-lose situation. Uh, scenario B is a case where if we were looking at a difference test, we could say that there's no evidence of a, a difference. Um, but at the same time, if we were doing an equivalence test, we could conclude that the two uh, conditions are equivalent. Mu A is uh, equivalent to mu B because it's within the margin plus or minus delta. And then finally, and this is the most uh, unusual case, we have a case where the uh, interval does not include zero. So we cannot conclude that, we can conclude that they're different, but it's also within the equivalence margin. So we can conclude that they're equal. Said otherwise, we can conclude both that they're different and they're equal. But the difference here is that we're, uh, uh, we should concentrate on the right question. Uh, this, again, I'll offer is the most important step in this scientific method, and that is get the question right in the first place. And for the most part, we're trying to uh, establish equivalence in pharmaceutical development and life cycle management. So in this case, because the confidence interval falls within the equivalence margin, we would conclude that they're equivalent we'd make no statement about their difference. Now you'll notice that these confidence intervals get uh, narrower and narrower as I go across scenarios. And I'll show in a moment that the width of the confidence interval is associated with successfully supporting the research hypothesis. And this is the basis of the second step of the scientific method, that is method, uh, uh, study design. So the purpose of study design is to reduce uncertainty or variability in an estimate that we make of a research parameter. Uh, let's look at this in the, in the, from the standpoint of release testing, where again, the estimate I'm going to call Y sub-release, and the parameter we're studying is mu sub-release. Now, because of uncertainty, uh, we could risk, uh, uh, in this case, a probability of being out of specification. So the figure I show, which is associated with doing one test of a sample, gives us a distribution which uh, falls uh, somewhat mainly in uh, the uh, specification range, but also has a relatively high probability of out of specification result uh, represented by the areas outside of the specification range. Now, uncertainty, also risk, can be reduced using replication. And in statistics, we call that uh, sample size determination or determining N uh, other than, in this case, N equal to one. And if we uh, increase N, we might find that the risk of OOS has decreased with this increased sample size. So again, going from N equal to one to N equal to four, the area, in this case, the blue shaded area, is much reduced over the uh, red shaded area that we saw before. Thus, we can reduce variability and risk uh, uh, simultaneously uh, uh, with the uh, with a uh, increase in sample size. Uncertainty is also impacted by other design considerations. I won't go into much detail about this, except to mention blocking or pairing. So, for instance, in comparability. We sometimes think to pair samples from an old and new process within the same analytical runs to reduce the variability by getting rid of the run-to-run -run variability uh, of the assay. Study conduct might uh, concentrate uh, initially or mainly upon tools like randomization. Uh, this is used when there might be influential, sometimes called nuisance, factors which can alter the study outcome. Uh, for instance, time may be a factor that we'd like to randomize over because during experimentation, there may be a learning curve or fatigue might set in influencing the results of the experiment. Uh, we're possibly 
uh, uh, aware of or commonly considered is uh, location effects in multi-well plates and cage effects in an in vivo assay, in which case we would randomize across the plate or perhaps between cages. And then finally, we might randomize across operators or uh, some other uh, significant factor, perhaps an assay reagent lot. One other matter of conduct would be, what do we do with the data? And uh, the rule of thumb is to store as many digits as possible, all digits, and only round results after the final calculation. This is not commonly done in uh, the pharmaceutical industry where common practice is to store to the number of digits of the specification. So if a specification has only two digits, usually only two digits is, are stored. But if we go on to reuse that data, for instance, for stability analysis, we've lost a lot of information. And this can result in added variability in the study. So let's look at the last step. And if every other step has been done correctly, we have choices. In fact, we have choices among statistical tools, uh, such as bioassay analysis, t-tests, sample size determination, and regression. But we also have choices of statistical software, such as sigma plot, jump, and even Excel. What features should we look for if we uh, pick a, a particular statistical package? And the, the ones I would look for are capable graphics and data screening tools, uh, and the ability to design our experiments as well as analyze them, uh, either using design of experiments or to determine sample size for a different kind of formulation of a study. We should also be aware of uh, the help features in the software, including the conclusions. Some software packages will actually write a report for the user, which will uh, draft the conclusions in the language of the particular study being performed. And then finally, we're all aware that we need to be uh, Part 11 compliant. When in doubt, however, I would argue that uh, if you have a, a CMC statistician available to you, please consult a CMC statistician. Some of the techniques that I've listed here are actually quite complex and require sophisticated understanding of the underlying assumptions and the mechanism for performing those analyses. So in summary, the scientific method benefits from recognition of many statistical principles and practices. The research question, uh, the alternative hypothesis as I formulated, should be considered carefully since this drives the process towards a successful conclusion. If we get the question wrong, all of the rest is for naught. Study design reduces the uncertainty in a study result, while randomization helps mitigate the bias introduced by hidden study factors. And then finally, partnerships between CMC statistician and non-statisticians can help reduce risks of making a wrong decision. So to end, I'd like to acknowledge the members of uh, the AAPS CMC statistics community and my fellow pharmaceutical scientists and regulators who have granted me the honor and privilege of participating in their application of the scientific method.